hello everyone. Good morning, class. Good morning. Um, okay, uh, this is our revision session on the materials that we have gone through this semester. Okay, so in today's class, uh, uh, this is our last class, right? We're going to go through all the materials that uh, we have done this semester and uh, review these materials. Okay, but uh, before that, let me take your attendance. Okay, uh, Brenda. Morning, uh, Chan Su Pian, right? Chia Chai Siu, Chu Zhang Heng, Chu Zhang Heng, Chua Yu Yang, okay, Ernest, Ernest, right? Go Kian Sing, Go Kian Sing, Hu Heng Dong, Ku Bun Kiong, Ku Bun Kiong, Lao Lok Jing, okay, Li Zi Lim, Li Chun Wei, Li Chun Wei, Lim Wen Yang. Lim Wen Yang, Lim Yong Chuan, Lim Yong Chuan, Long Yao Ting, oh, Lim Yong Chuan, okay, Long Yao Ting, Lu Tiong Lia, okay, Lu Jui Min, Ng Han Xiang, Ng Wei Hong, Ong Mei Lin, okay, uh, Hong Shui Wen, Hong Shui Wen, Hua Yi Hang, Hua Yi Hang, right, So Yen Cheng, Morning, uh, Kan Xin Shen. Okay, Tio Leong Ho. Tio Leong Ho, all right. Tio Yi Si. Wong Chong Yi. Wong Chong Yi. Wong Ka Sing. Okay, uh, Yong Wing Liang. Uh, Yong Chi Ye. Okay, good morning. All right, let me check again. Huh? Uh, Chu Zhang Hing, are you here? Chu Zhang Hing. Chu Zhang Hing. Go Kian Sing, Go Kian Sing, Ku Bun Kiong, Ku Bun Kiong, uh, Lim Chun Wei, Lim Chun Wei, Lim Wen Yang, Lim Wen Yang, Long Yao Ting, Long Yao Ting, uh, Hong Shui Wen, Hong Shui Wen. Wong Chong Yi, oh, Hong Shui Wen is here, okay, thank you. And uh, Wong Chong Yi, All right, uh, I will check your attendance again uh, later. Okay, so uh, now before we start the class, uh, uh, can I just have some feedback on you? Uh, how do you find this course? Um, uh, is there anything that you think uh, can be improved? Right, uh, basically, uh, any feedback? Uh, Good or bad, okay. So I uh we can improve this course uh, for the next uh semester. Yes, uh, if there is any feedback uh, if you would like to give some feedback uh, can you provide some feedback on how uh this course can be improved? Any feedback or everything is okay? <laughs> uh oh, it's the most informative and detailed course so far. Oh, thank you very much. So, okay, so the, the information is enough. Uh, do you feel that there is too much, too much to learn, too much assignments, too much to learn, or uh, the amount is just nice? Your feedback. Uh, uh, it, it's okay. La. So uh, I just want to take note of any feedback uh, so I can put this into the... Uh, cost review form. Uh, okay, it's, so it's a personal matter. Uh, um, uh, per personal matter is fine. Uh, I just want to know uh, if, because if all of you, uh, you give the same feedback on something, uh, then that means it must be true. Uh, so I will uh, try to improve that part of the subject. Uh. That's why I'm asking everyone whether you feel the same about uh, something about the cost. Maybe that there is too much materials or uh, the pace is too fast or too much cost work to do, things like that. Any feedback? feedback. Okay, so uh, if, if you have any feedback later, uh, you can uh, WhatsApp or email me. Lah, right? If you have any feedback uh, on how you feel that this course uh, can be improved, anything you find challenging in this course, uh, uh, you can WhatsApp or email me. 
then uh, I will put that in into changes uh, for the next uh, for the coming semester. Okay, influence, yeah. Influence. Okay, thanks. Right. Okay. Um. Now, so uh, as as promised, as promised, we will look at the the revision of the materials that we have gone through this semester. Now, first of all, uh, is your online announcement, uh, sorry, your your online assessment, uh, online assessment. Uh. So may I know uh, what is the date? Uh? It's announced in your student timetable already, right? What is the date and time of your final exam? Uh? Uh, anyone knows? <clears throat> Anyone has uh, this information? Okay, uh, 7, 7, 7 October. 7, huh? 7, 7 October, right? 7 October. Okay, is that, uh, which day is that? Uh? Which day is that? Okay, thank you. 9 a.m. Uh, which, which day is that? Thursday, okay. Okay, so... Uh, 7th of October, Thursday. So, uh, everyone, you can help check. Uh, this is correct. Uh, make sure it's correct. 11.30 uh, a.m. So, it's a two and a half hours paper. Right? It's, this is uh, the same uh, for all your uh, bachelor papers. Right? So, seven. let me just confirm this. Uh, 7th of October is a uh, Thursday. Yes, correct. Okay. So 7 October, Thursday, 9 to 11.30 a.m. is the, your exam. Oh. Now, uh, please join this Google Meet. Uh. So we are going to use this Google Meet for your final exam. So please join this Google Meet uh, 15 minutes before uh, the start time of this online assessment to complete the student's uh, declaration form. Right. So uh, please write, please uh, copy and write the uh, student's declaration form uh, on the first page of your uh, answer sheet. Okay, so as you know, uh, because I'm sure all of you are very familiar with this already. Uh, I'm sure all of you are very uh, familiar with familiar with this already. Okay. So, uh, on your exam question paper, or the cover page, uh, on the cover page of your exam question paper, there is a student's declaration of originality form. Okay, basically, you're just writing, uh, I declare that everything I write is uh, my own work. Then you write your name and you sign, and you write the subject that you're taking, you know, just a few lines up. So, uh, you copy the student's declaration of originality form, copy it all, and write it on the first page of your answer sheet. Okay, so you don't have, so when you submit your answer sheet, or your declaration of originality will be there as well. So we don't have to do extra work. You don't have to upload another Google form, though, all the stuff, right? So this is the most efficient way. And uh, so please join uh, 15 minutes before the start. That means uh, 7 October, Thursday, 8.45 a.m. 8.45 a.m., uh, please uh, log in, okay, and complete this, and uh, I will check that all of you are present uh, before we start, okay? So, right, now this uh, this exam is 60%, 40% is your coursework, so uh, I will return your coursework marks this week, right, your assignment one and assignment two, your coursework mark this week, so you can add them up and you know how much is your coursework marks, uh, okay? All right. Now, this is a, this is a open book final online assessment. So that means uh, you can refer to the internet, you can refer to textbook, you can refer to any materials uh, except uh, help from another person. Okay, you cannot get help from another person. Okay, and then um, another thing is, so the last thing is, uh, please, uns please, uh, please, Hand write your answer. Okay, handwritten. Uh. Please hand write your answer on blank or ruled A4 size paper. That means a uh, blank or full scale paper. Uh. Okay, and submit a clear photo of each page used. Please uh, compile 
please compile all pages into a single PDF. Compile all pages into a single PDF uh, before submitting. Okay, save this. All right. <clears throat> so uh, please handwrite your answer on blank or rule A4 size paper. So uh, have some blank or full scat paper, A4 size, write your answers inside. And on your first page, uh, you write your student's declaration of originality uh, on the top of the first page. And then you can start writing your answer. So after you finish at the end of the exam, 11.30 a.m., uh, you take a photo of every page, compile them all into a single PDF and submit. Okay, so uh, the time uh, to do that is 30 minutes. Uh. So from 11.30 a.m. to 12 noon, uh, you have 30 minutes to take photo and compile everything. Uh. Okay, I think uh, 30 minutes is a lot already, uh, so definitely no problem. Uh. Okay, I think everyone is very familiar with this note, so no questions here. Uh. Right? All okay, yeah. Uh. Okay, so let's let's go to the let's go to uh, our revision now. Let's go to our revision now. So we have uh four four questions. We have four questions, uh. So let me copy this and let me put this here. Okay, so we got uh four questions. Okay, we got four questions. So uh, the first question, uh, each question is 25 marks, uh, standard. The, the first question is on uh, processor architecture, assembly language interrupts and memory. Okay, so this is basically uh, your processor architecture. Uh, your ARM Cortex-M processor, assembly language, the interrupt mechanism, and the memory system. Uh, so this is your processor architecture. Okay, then uh, question two, uh, is on software development, which is uh, basically uh, writing programs using your GPIO. Okay, you write some program using your GPIO to do something. Uh. Okay. Uh, low power and debug. Uh. Low power and debug, these are just uh, concept. Uh. These are just concept, right? Theory. These are theory. So uh, I won't be asking much uh, theory questions. Okay, so uh, every question you will have some programming work to do. Uh. And then the third question uh, is on uh, real-time systems. So RTS, uh, R your real-time system programming, RTOS, and operating system support. And lastly, uh, for question four is on system design. Okay, so let's let's look at our uh, materials now. So we started with uh, week one. Uh, <clears throat> on week one, uh, we looked at, okay. So on week one, uh, we started with concept. Uh, so we talk about uh, why you want to use microcontrollers. That's the whole purpose of this subject. Uh. In this subject, you learn to build embedded systems using microcontrollers. So why do you want to use uh, microcontrollers? Uh? Because uh, microcontrollers will make the product faster, cheaper, and more flexible. Okay, but uh, the product must be an electrical product uh, because you cannot control something that is not electrical. Uh, must have elec it must run on electricity uh, in order to put the microcontroller inside. So it makes it faster, cheaper, and more flexible. And whenever you design an embedded system, uh, whenever you design an embedded system, you always start uh, by drawing a block diagram because you have to identify your microcontroller that you are using, uh, the input devices, what are the sensors, and then what are your output devices or your actuators? Okay, in this case, heating element and lamp. And then you need power source. Power source, how are you going to power your system? Is it mains power, battery power, or solar power, etc.? And you need user interface. This is to interact with the user. Okay, so in a better system, uh, the block diagram, you have the processing element, the input devices, the, the sensors, the output devices or the actuators, the power supply, and the user interface, right? So what do we use an embedded system for? What do we use an embedded system for? There are four main uh, categories of usage. We use embedded systems uh, <clears throat> for closed loop control. That means you have, uh, you have a sensor that measures the output, and then uh, your processor will constantly uh, Control the out control the output so that uh, it is um, tracking the desired uh, output. 
So here you specify what's the desired output, and then your controller will keep adjusting the output device to produce the desired output. Uh, and you got feedback. So this is called closed loop control. Okay. Uh, in order to implement the closed loop control, you have to write the equation, uh, the transfer function. So in C programming, that's easy. Uh, you can just write the map equation, right? Now, next one uh, is um, sequencing. So this is what we have been doing. Uh, when you do your assignment one, assignment two, uh, we're actually doing sequencing. Sequencing is you go through a steps, a sequence of steps, right? State machine, uh, a state machine uh, is sequencing. You go through steps. So an example of sequencing is washing machine. Uh. Washing machine uh, is just a sequence of steps, right? When you turn it on. Now, this is the second one. So the third one uh, is, so you got closed loop control, you got sequencing. And then the last two is, the last two is uh, signal processing and communication. So we use uh, microcontrollers uh, for signal conditioning and processing, uh, filtering, uh, right? And then uh, we also use it for communication networking, wireless communication. So four main uh, categories of use. So then uh, how do we use it? So if I want to do this now, I want to use a microcontroller controller to do something. How do I do it? So first of all, uh, uh, you have to know um, uh, how, what is the microcontroller. So inside your microcontroller, uh, this is the processor, okay? This is, for example, this is the Cortex-M0, right? You have components inside the processor. Uh, we go through some of the main components already, uh, which is the interrupt controller, the WIC, the memory protection unit, the CPU, the debug, the debug system, right? The debug access port. Uh, this is also part of the debug system, the instruction trace. So this is your CPU. <clears throat> but the CPU by itself uh, is not very useful. We need to support the CPU uh, with memory and peripherals. Uh, so that's how you build an, a microcontroller. A microcontroller uh, is the processor, right? Connected to memory and peripherals uh, through a, a system of buses. So that gives you your microcontroller, okay? And the microcontroller, in order to use it uh, normally, uh, we will buy a development board, okay? So the microcontroller, uh, this is your microcontroller. Uh, it will be on a development board, okay? And then you will, you will on the development board, uh, there is another microcontroller. This is the debugger. This is the microcontroller uh, that acts as the debugger. It, its function no, is the middleman between your host computer, your host computer, and the target microcontroller. So the host computer can program the target microcontroller using this middleman. So why you need the middleman? Because the middleman speaks USB on one side to your computer, and it speaks uh, uh, JTAG or SWD, the debugging, the debugging language uh, with your microcontroller. Okay, so. And uh, with this system, uh, development bots become very cheap already uh, because all you need is just one low-cost microcontroller here for your computer to communicate with the target microcontroller. So it becomes very cheap. You can buy development bots uh, for 50 ringgit or less. The STM32, uh, they are the cheapest. Uh, that's why they're so popular. Okay, so now, okay, we got the development bot already. So how do we start writing our program? So to start writing your program, uh, you use development tools. Uh, Okay, so this is uh, this is the all the development tools, uh, all the tools that you have in Kill Microvision. Kill Microvision is a very popular development tool. So you got your uh, project manager, device database, your editor, your text editor to write your source code, and then you got your compiler, assembler, linker, and then you got your debugger simulator, right? And then you've got all, all your uh, libraries. You've got all your libraries. So your libraries, uh, you add them using this guy, right? Uh, this, this one. This uh, software installer, software pack installer. You click this uh, to add in all the libraries that you need. Uh, right? Okay. So this is the development tools. Uh, and uh, uh, this is how it works. Right? This is how it works. So you have uh, Microvision. This is your development tool. Then you write your application. You write your application code, your user program. So when you write your application code, you can write it in three different ways. Three different ways. You see, I got three arrow here. One arrow, 
two arrow and three arrow okay so three different ways the first way uh, is you write your application code uh, to control the hardware directly that means uh, you write your own libraries you write the led.h you write the led.c to control the gpio right so you're actually doing this you are controlling uh, the hardware directly okay. now if you don't want to control the hardware directly then no, you use a HAL. The HAL is called a hardware abstraction layer. Hardware abstraction layer. So there are a few names for this. Uh. There are a few names for this. Uh, so this is software development. Uh. A HAL uh, or a hardware ab abstraction layer, uh, it is basically uh, abstracting away or hiding away uh, all the hardware all the hardware underneath so for example the hardware abstraction layer is also known as it is also known as uh, PAL it is also known as the peripheral access layer I don't know why they have a lot of names for this one and it is also known as API uh, application programming interface these are all the same thing uh, it means the same thing uh, okay so Hardware abstraction layer, peripheral access layer, application programming interface. Uh, they all refer to this. This is your, it's your library. It's your, it's actually a library of functions. Okay? It's a library of, it's a library of functions and uh, <clears throat> library of uh, function, um, so library, you know, like is your is your dot c and your dot c and your dot h dot c and dot h file. So uh, the dot c contains the function body and the dot h contains the function prototypes. Uh, okay. So uh, the library uh, uh, provides you with some functions. For example, now you don't need to program the hardware directly. You can use a uh, LED init, for example. Uh, uh, you use L, you call a function LED init provided to you in the library. Uh, then you can initialize the hardware already. You use a function LED on, LED off. You can turn on and off everything. You don't have to know what is inside. So that's the hardware abstraction layer. Okay. Now you can even go another step higher. If you go another step higher, uh, then uh, you are using middleware. Middleware is, for example, your CMC's RTOS. Okay. Your CMC's RTOS. Now your CMC's RTOX, your kill RTX that you're using, uh, your real-time operating system. Uh, the real-time operating system uh, actually uh, communicates with hardware uh, using the existing libraries. Uh, so your hardware abstraction layer, for example, uh, your LPC17XX.h, you know, that's a very common uh, common uh, library, right? Your LPC17XX.h, right? It contains all the uh, pointer names to access the hardware man, right so your operating system uh, uses those existing libraries to access the hardware so this even higher level so you can use the rtos uh, instead of uh, accessing those directly so there are three generally are uh, three layers uh, okay so you should know what these are and you have been using them anyway okay assignment one you did hal this uh, peripheral access layer you did in assignment one and assignment two, you use the middleware RTOS. Okay. Right. Now on this side, oh, this is debugging. This is debugging. So uh, in your mouse controller, or besides the standard hardware, you also got the debug hardware, the debug circuitry. You need the CMC's DAP or the debugger uh, hardware, you know, the additional microcontroller. Right? You need that additional microcontroller to access the debug hardware. Okay. okay? And uh, how do you do it? You use the debugger user interface. So on Microvision, when you launch the debug session, you, you, have, you have access to the debugger user interface. Uh, and then you can, through the CMC's DAP, debug your microcontroller. That means uh, run the program on the actual microcontroller. Run and test. You run and test the program on the actual microcontroller. Okay. So this CMC's SVD, as we described uh, last week, uh, CMC's SVD uh, is the system view description. It allows you to see all the peripheral registers. Uh, you know, in your debugger, uh, 
you can open the ABC window. Then you can see all the ABC registers, right? Then you open the serial port window, you can see all the serial port registers. You open the GPIO window, you can see all the GPIO registers. So all of this uh, is standardized by CMC's SVD. We call it system view description. It is a standardized uh, format uh, for displaying all the peripheral registers. That is why uh, when, when you debug LPC1768 and when you debug STM32F, uh, it feels the same, right? The debug, the debugger interface uh, feels the same, although there are microcontrollers from different vendors. Right? Uh, that's, that's the good thing about standardization. Okay. All right. So uh, this is how you use the, the flow of using microvision. Uh, and these are your files. These are your files. So you write your program, uh, write your program in C or assembly. Okay. If you write in C, you need to compile, you get object file. If you write in assembly, you assemble, you get object file. And these object files, uh, together with uh, pre-compiled library files. Uh. Library files uh, are actually .c and .s files uh, that have already been compiled, okay? So it's like object file. Uh. So all your, your object files and the library file uh, will be combined together by the linker uh, and placed into your microcontroller memory at specific addresses, okay? So at which address? Uh, then the linker will have to refer to a scatter loading file. This scatter loading file contains information about the implemented memory of the microcontroller. Because your microcontroller, uh, it can have maximum 512 MB of uh, memory, but is 512 MB fully implemented? No, man. Some microcontrollers will have more memory, some microcontrollers will have less. So the amount of memory available and the range of address is uh, described in the scatter loading file. So the linker has to refer to this file to know how much memory this microcontroller have so that uh, and where is the memory the address so that it can place all this uh, code and data into the correct place uh. right and then it generates this uh, uh, image file okay an image file is then uh, downloaded into your microcontroller or you can simulate a virtual device simulate this uh, program on the virtual device or you can test it on the actual device using debugger, right? Okay, so uh, how about the file structure? This is the file uh, structure. This is the file structure. So this is your main.c, okay? This is your main.c. You write your program, main.c. Main.c, uh, all you need to do is include the device header file. For example, lpc17xx.h. Once you include the device header file, right? The device header file will further pull in no, your system files, right? And the uh, CMC's core library. What is this CMC's core library? Eh? You know, you use functions like uh, uh, NVIC uh, interrupt enable, NVIC interrupt disable. So system config. All these, where do they come from? They come from here. These are the standardized uh, CMC's core functions. Right, they come from this uh, header file, and then now uh, you use things like underscore underscore wfi. Uh. So where do they come from? Uh, they come from here. The CMC's core uh, instruction header file, which allow you to access assembly instructions in C. Uh. Okay, so this is the CMC's core library, which is pulled in uh, by your device header file. Okay, the system files, uh, as you know by now, uh, the system file is used to configure your clock, right? Uh, so this is also pulled in by your device header file. So all you need to do in your main file uh, is to include this device header file and everything will be accessible to you. Okay. When you create a new project, uh, when you create a new project, uh, you will specify the device that you are using, right? Uh, because you specify the device that you are using also in your new project, uh, all these files are automatically inserted into your project already for you because you select the device already. Man. So all these are device specific one, right? So they'll all be included already. So if you create project wizard or you create a new project, you use LPC1768. Uh, so all the files for LPC1768 uh, will already be inside your project already. Uh. Okay. All right. So this is uh, uh, what you learned in chapter one, microcontrollers and development tools. Now we move on to chapter two, uh, 
where you start to code. We move on to chapter two, oh, where you start to code. So the first thing that you do in coding, uh, the first thing that you do in coding uh, is to control the GPIO, right? To control the GPIO. So uh, this is uh, this will be question two, uh, right? So now we are talking about question two first. Okay, we are talking about question two first. So you need to know how to do GPIO uh, programming, uh, GPIO programming, basic GPIO programming to control things, and I'm sure after you do assignment one and assignment two, uh, GPL programming is very simple already. Uh, simple stuff, right? Just uh, program, configure the GPIO to uh, turn on and turn off the GPIO pins. Okay? So in order to control the GPIO, you need to write the, the code, right? To configure and use the GPIO. So rather than you just write the code and put it into your main file, uh, I, normally I advise you to write it as a library, right? You know, in your assignment two, you control the night rider. So you will create a LED.h and a LED.c. That's a library to initialize the GPIO for the LEDs. Okay, right. And then, um, uh, in order to do your programming, you will use the you will use uh, the the device header file. So the device the device header file the device header file. For example, uh, the LPC one seven six one LPC one seven XX uh, uh, LPC one seven XX dot H. So the device header file is very important because it provides you with it provides you with uh, this it provides you with this the hardware abstraction layer or peripheral access layer or API or uh, API. It, it provides you with this. So what this does is uh, you get uh you you have the pointers and the data structures uh, to access the peripherals. Okay, the device header file uh, provides you uh, with the pointers uh, and the structures uh, to to access the peripheral registers. Okay, so all right, so how how do we do this? How do we uh, how do we write if if you want if you need to do this yourself uh, if you need to create the pointers and structures to access peripheral registers yourself uh, how do you do it how do you do it so you have to know the basic steps first uh. you have to know the basic steps first uh. so the basic step uh, if you want to uh, uh, control the GPIO peripheral uh, basic step uh, is step one step one you have to enable the clock. Right. Ah, so for assignment one, uh, this would be your RCC, APB2 ENR register, right? The reset and clock control uh, register. Uh, so you use that to enable the clock to the GPIO, step one. Then step two, uh, you have to configure the IO pin. Uh, so assignment one, you use the AFIO, right? Alternate function IO register. You select uh, which IO pin that you need to use, uh, which function of the IO pin you need to use, okay? And then number three, yeah, you, you configure the peripheral. So you need to configure, you want input or output. You want a pull up or pull down, all right? And then finally, step four uh, is interrupt configuration. Do you want the GPIO to generate interrupts? Okay, so these are the four basic steps to program GPIO. Uh. And then uh, we have to start coding already. Uh. So to start coding, uh, you have to access peripheral registers. To access peripheral registers, uh, we use the pointer method okay we use the pointer method so uh, this is the pointer method uh, the pointer method okay you define uh, you define uh, a pointer you define a pointer uh, pointing to a specific address so you know the peripheral register that you want to access okay this is the address so you create a pointer uh, pointing to that address and then by using this pointer uh, you can access that register Right? So this is how you do it yourself. Lah. This is how you do it yourself. If you don't have the header file, okay? if you don't have the header file, you do this yourself, and then you can use FIO set already. Uh, FIO set, you can use it like this already. Okay? If you don't have the header file. But if you have the header file, then you don't have to do this yourself. You can just refer to the pointer names inside the header file. Okay? But uh, you need to know how to 
do this stuff. You need to know how to do this. Okay, you need to know how to do this. So, uh, uh, the second question uh, is you need to know uh, uh, how to create your own pointers and structures to access peripheral registers. Okay, how to create your own pointers and structures to access peripheral registers. And an example uh, would be tutorial. An example would be tutorial two. Uh, which question was that? An example would be tutorial two, uh, question uh, five, right? So tutorial two, question five here, uh, there is a nice example here which show you, uh, okay, if you want to access a peripheral, right? You want to access a peripheral starting from this address. The peripheral are uh, starting from this address uh, and there are three registers. Okay, how will you do it? So this is how you do it. Uh, you just create the pointers, uh, uh, to create the pointers to access those registers. You create the pointers to access those registers at the given addresses. Okay, but if you have a few of these peripheral, then this would be a very waste of memory. Ma. So better would be you put them into a data structure. Then no, you just need to create a pointer to the data structure. You don't have to create a pointer to every single register. You put all the registers, group them into a structure, then you just use a pointer to point to the structure, right? This saves memory. Okay, and this is the standard way uh, how microcontroller header files are written. So you should know how to write this yourself. Okay, you should know how to write this yourself, uh, right? So that's that's for question two, uh, GPIO programming, header files. You should know how to write uh, the pointers and structures in the header file to access peripheral registers. Okay. All right. Um, uh, that's chapter two. Okay, so now uh, we go to now uh, we go to question one. So question one now uh, is on the Cortex architecture already. Right? So we go to question one, uh, the processor architecture. Okay, so the processor architecture, uh, the, the processor architecture, uh, the important thing that you need to realize is uh, how do you use the processor? So all these stuff are theory. Uh. The important thing that you need to know is uh, how do you use the processor? Okay, so the processor, uh, if you want to use it, uh, the processor appears to you uh, as a set of 16 registers and you got three special registers. So these are your uh, normal registers. Now the normal registers are uh, R0 to R12 are called general purpose. You can use them for anything. R13 is special. It is the stack pointer. R14 is special. It's the link register to hold the return address when you do program branching. R15 is the program counter to indicate the next instruction to fetch from memory. Okay, so these are your 16 registers. And then you got special register. XPSR is the program status register normally used to uh, hold the ALU flex, uh, right? ALU flex to indicate the result of ALU operation. This is to enable and disable all interrupts. And the control register is to select you want to use main stack pointer or process stack pointer and select you want privilege or unprivileged. So uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this already. So now uh, we, you got these uh, registers. What do you do with registers? To operate on registers, uh, we write assembly language program. To operate on registers, right? we write assembly language program. And assembly language program, uh, the first things that you, you learn to do uh, is to move data around, move data around. So you learn some instructions to move data around. And then after that, you learn some instructions to operate on the data. Besides moving data around, you must know how to operate on data. Okay. So now, uh, let me ask you one question. Let me ask you one question. Why, why do we need to use assembly language? Why do we need to use our assembly language? Now, now you can do everything using C already. Oh. C programming is so easy to write. Lah. 
why do we still need to write in assembly? Le? Can you give me a few reasons uh, why we should still write in assembly? Why is assembly language uh, still around? Okay. Is there a very, very important use of assembly language that simply cannot be, it cannot be replaced by C? What do you think? Any ideas? Uh, do you, do you, can you think of any reason or why we need to code in assembly? Uh, no, we. Uh, if you code in assembly, oh, you 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 will know how the mount controllable at a very deep level. Uh, fix bugs that cannot be detected in C. Yes, also. No, actually, uh, this is correct because our registers got no address, right? The you see, ah. Uh, you have no choice uh, but to write in assembly because uh, you want to access CPU registers. You want to access, when you want to access CPU registers, so R0 to R15, and these three special registers, uh, when you want to access CPU registers, okay, you cannot do this in C. Right? C doesn't uh, allow you to do this. Why? Le? Because uh, if you want to access a register in C programming, you have to specify the address, right? Because C programming, we access registers using pointer method. Pointer method. You have to create a pointer, give it the address of the register. Then you can access the register. But, but um, CPU registers, this R0 to R12, uh, for example, uh, got no address. So if they have no address, or you cannot create a pointer to point to them. So you cannot access them in C, right? So then comes my next question. Why do you want to access CPU register? Okay, we, we write in assembly because we need to access CPU register, right? CPU registers got no address now, so we have to write in assembly to access them. So my next question would be, uh, why do you need to access CPU registers? Is there a need for this? Won't the compiler generate code uh, to access CPU registers for us? The compiler will just, gen when you write your program in C language, uh, the compiler will just generate the assembly language to access the registers for you. So you don't need to do it yourself. Uh. Why do you need to access registers yourself? Can you think of any reason? Can you think of any reason why we need to access uh, CPU registers directly. Can you think of any reason why we need to access uh, CPU registers directly? Uh, the answer is somewhere along the way uh, in the things that you have learned. Right? It's, it's, actually, uh, it's actually one of the most uh, important topics in uh, week 10. Week 10, prevent data changes, prevent data changes. You write in assembly to prevent data changes. Um, well, uh, it's not entirely there. Uh, I, I tell you the hint no, is in week 10. It's in your week 10 lecture notes. If you go to your week 10 lecture notes uh, on operating system uh, support, uh, operating system support, uh, okay. And then uh, you go to your notes in uh, main step point. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're almost there. You're almost there. Uh, it has got to do with the stack. It has got to do with the stack. You see, if you if you scroll down, you scroll down your week 10 lecture notes, uh, the operating system support, the features of the microcontroller that supports operating systems. So you learn about the stack. The stack is very important, right? The stack is very important, no? So uh, if you want to access the stack, uh, if you want to access the stack, uh, to play with the stack pointer, right? And not only that, not only that, what is the main function? Uh, what is the most basic function of an embedded, uh, of, of an RTOS, of an operating system? Okay, I ask you another related question first. Uh. What is the most basic function? of an operating system.
what is the most basic function of an operating system? The most basic function. Why do we want an operating system? Don't, can't, isn't my life just fine without an operating system? Why do I want to use an RTOS, a real-time operating system? Because it allows us to... Yes, any ideas? Because it allows us to multitask. Yes, uh, run several uh, programs at the same time. So you saw in assignment two, or in assignment two, or using the RTOS, or you can so easily do three things at the same time, right? It seems so easy, or you can do the LEDs, you can do the PWM, and you can do the ADC, or and these three programs are running at the same time. You know, it's so interesting. The RTOS can allow you to do this. Then, uh, okay, you're right. RTOS allows us to multitask, run multiple tasks at the same time. How does the RTOS allow us to multitask? How does the RTOS allow us to multitask? What is the keyword? What is the keyword? How does the RTOS allow us to multitask? How do we run multiple tasks? Uh, you are right, shifting between tasks. And what is the, the technical term for changing between tasks? What is the technical name? Contact switching, contact switching, right? You switch contacts. So I ask you, uh, what is context referring to? What is context referring to? This is the heart of the problem. What is context referring to? We switch the context. The registers, yes, the registers, the registers, the registers. Context switching means uh, we switch the registers. You see, uh, you see, uh, uh, yes, using the stack, but you see, uh, it's like this, it's like this. Okay, it's like this. Now, Oops, wrong thing. Now, uh, it's like this. Okay, wait, uh, let me let me let me draw this out, uh. Let me draw this out, uh. Just give me uh, ten seconds, uh. Let me draw this out. Okay. Now you see, uh, this is memory. Okay, this is memory. Right, this is memory. So memory is very big. Okay. So some somewhere uh, in your somewhere in your uh, data memory. Somewhere in your data memory, your SRAM, SRAM, somewhere in data memory, SRAM. So you have one part of your data memory or SRAM uh, allocated for the stack, the stack of uh, track one. Let's say uh, we just talk about a very simple system. Uh, you got two tracks. You got two tracks. So you got track one and you got track two. So this is the stack of track one. This is the stack of track two. So this is where they store their stuff. Now, when track one is running, uh, when track one is running, uh, the CPU registers will be holding the values, the register values used by track one. So this is the, when track one is now running, uh, this is the values inside here, the values are used by track one. Fine. Okay. Now, then uh, we need to switch to track two. What do we do? To switch to track two, uh, you take all these registers, uh, all these registers, their value, uh, you copy them and you save them into track one stack first. You save them here first. So you save the context of track one. You save the, you save the register values of track one. The register values of track one, we call this the context of track one. Okay. Or to be more specific, like, it's the CPU context. You know the English word context? The English word context. Context means uh, if I simply say something like you don't know what I'm talking about, Emma. I simply just say uh, pool. I say pool. You don't know what I'm talking about, right? So I have to give you the whole context. Uh, swimming pool in Slango. Uh, then you know, oh, the swimming pool in Slango. If I just give you one word, uh, you don't know what that means. Uh, so I have to give you the context. 
the situation right, where that word is used. Okay, so context uh, refers actually to the CPU context. The CPU context uh, of track one, uh, that means the, C the state, the state of the CPU um, as it is used by track one, which is the register values used by track one. Uh. So uh, we have to save all these registers uh, used by track one, save it inside here first, then we take the register values used by track two, which is inside here, we load them here. Uh, then now you can run track two. Okay, so now you run track two. So track two is running, running, running. And then it's time to switch back to track one. So what do you do? You take the, the register values used by track two, you save it back into here, save it back inside here. And then you take the register values used by track one, you load them into here, load them here, and then you run track one. Okay, so track one, run, run, run. Until it's time to switch to track two, then you take all these register values, you save them back into the stack of track one, then you take the register values of track two, load them here, and then you run track two. Okay, so this is what we mean uh, by a context switching. We are actually, uh, switching the register values in the CPU to the values used by the currently running thread. So whichever thread needs to run, no, you need to put that thread's register values uh, into the CPU registers. And then only you run that thread. Okay? So whenever we switch threads, we need to switch the CPU register values. Okay? And the stack, uh, the stack uh, is used to store the CPU register values used by that thread. Okay, so this is what we mean by context switching. Now, who performs context switching? Where is the context switching code? Where is the code to switch the CPU registers? The code to switch CPU registers uh, is here inside the pen SV handler. Okay. So for real-time systems, uh, it is very important uh, that you understand uh, uh, context switching because uh, this is the basic mechanism of RTOS. Any operating system, uh, any operating system, uh, the basic mechanism uh, is multitasking to allow multiple tasks to run at the same time. How do you do that? Using context switching. Okay. How do we do con how do we do context switching? We use the pen SV uh, handler. We put the context switching code uh, inside the pen SV handler. Okay, so pen SV handler is an exception. Uh, okay, who triggers the pen SV handler? The SysTick timer. Okay, you see ah, uh, here uh, This is the SysTick timer. So if you want if you want one millisecond system tick, so you will program the SysTick timer, not you. Uh, the operating system uh, will initialize the SysTick timer with, uh, to generate one, one interrupt every one millisecond. Okay. If you want one millisecond system tick, uh, then no, no, the operating system will initialize the SysTick handler to generate an interrupt every one millisecond. So every one millisecond, the SysTick handler will run. Okay, so this is a very simple scheduler. Every one millisecond, uh, when the SysTick handler runs, uh, it will switch to the next task. So if now is task one, uh, then you switch to task two. If now is task two, you switch to task three. If now is task three, then you will switch back to task uh, zero. All right, if zero, then switch to one. So you've got four tasks here. So every time the SysTick handler runs, uh, it will schedule the next task to run. But SysTick handler, uh, doesn't do the context switching. Systic handler will trigger. Systic handler will trigger the pen SV handler to run to do context switching. So how do you trigger the pen SV handler? In the Systic handler, you set the pen SV hand, uh, interrupt flag. You set the pen SV exception flag. Okay, you can set the flag. Uh. So uh, this line, uh, the system handler set the uh, interrupt pending flag uh, of the pen SV interrupt or the pen SV exception. Uh, okay? 
So once you set it, uh, then the panel screen will need to run already. Uh. But normally, uh, what we do is uh, we set pen SV to lowest priority. Why do we set the pen SV exception to lowest priority? Uh, so that uh, it doesn't disturb interrupts. Okay. So uh, the contact switching uh, will only happen, uh, pen SV will only run uh, to do contact switching uh, when all interrupts have been served. Okay, if there are a lot of interrupts, your processor will need to respond to all those interrupts first. Once it has responded to all the interrupts only, finally in the end, uh, it will go and run the pen SV handler to do contact switching. Okay? That's why we call it pen SV uh, pendable, pendable. It can be pended, it can be delayed. Okay. So uh, now the one that cannot be delayed uh, is SVC. The one that cannot be delayed uh, is SVC. Okay. So what is the difference between SVC and pen SV? What is the difference between SVC and pen SV? When when you have you have uh you you already know this uh, you got a thread uh, you got a thread uh, the thread got no privilege so if the thread wants to access uh, the kernel if the thread wants to access the kernel objects uh, the thread wants to access the kernel objects for example uh, wants to access the message queue right or the semaphore so all these things are uh, the kernel objects are uh, you need a uh, privilege you need privilege but threads got no privilege right so how does threads uh, uh, get something from the message queue you know when you execute os message get how you, how you get the message you need privilege or thread don't have privilege so what actually happens is uh, when you execute os message get uh, what is actually happening is uh, you you are actually uh, triggering uh, svc exception right when you execute those uh, operating system functions uh, all those operating system functions are uh, when you execute them or you are actually triggering a svc exception so when you trigger svc exception uh, the svc handler will then run the svc handler will then run uh, and then it will perform the requested operation okay so the purpose of svc uh, is for threads uh, to request an RTOS operation uh, that requires privilege. For example, getting a message from the message queue, uh, reading, get, waiting for a semaphore, setting a semaphore, uh, setting a signal, all this stuff, uh, they are all done inside the SVC handler. Okay? So all your RTOS functions, uh, all those operations, uh, they are done inside SVC handler, except for, except for contact switching. Contact switching is done. Contact switching is done in the pen SV handler. Right? It's the only thing that's done in pen SV handler, contact switching. Okay. And of course you got the third one, uh, Sysstick handler. Uh. So you got three. All your operating system code, uh, all your operating system code, uh, they are placed in three handlers. Sysstick handler, SVC handler, and pen SV handler. So Sysstick hand SVC handler is for your track to request for uh, all those RTOS services which require privilege. Uh, right? They are all in SVC handler. Pen SV handler is where the contact switching code is placed. Systic handler is where all the time management code is placed. Right? Okay, so now we are very clear on that. Uh, let's come back to contact switching and the pen SV handler. So you know that uh, the basic function of and RTOS is to do multitasking. Multitasking means we have to switch between threads. How do we switch between threads? We have to, to switch between threads, we have to change, switch the register values, right? And these registers, uh, you cannot access in C, man. you have to access in assembly. That is why, that is why uh, your hand SV handler, the context, switching code in pen sv handler is written in assembly right so you cannot run away from this all operating system now if you want to do contact switching now you have to access the registers but you have to save and load registers so you have to write that in assembly ah, so uh, you, as you can see here uh, the pen sv handler uh, 
is written in assembly. To tell the compiler that you are writing in assembly, you use underscore underscore ASM. So this special uh, command here, underscore underscore ASM, or you are telling the compiler, I'm going to write this function in assembly. Uh, so the compiler will give you an error uh, if you write in assembly. So then you write in assembly. Uh. So what does this code do? Uh? Now, uh, as you know, uh, as you know, uh, whenever, as you know, uh, whenever you, whenever an interrupt happens, whenever an interrupt happens, whenever an exception happens, okay, automatic stacking will will be uh, done by the CPU, uh, by the NVIC, uh, automatic stacking. Okay. Now, whenever, whenever an interrupt happens, uh, whenever an interrupt happens, uh, or an exception, uh, pen SV is an exception, right? Uh, so whenever an interrupt or exception happens, like pen SV, uh, before the processor runs the handler, before the processor run the run the pen SV handler, before the processor run the pen SV handler, it will save some registers into the stack first, right? Uh, so you see, uh, it's so handy that R0, R1, R2, R3, R12, LR, PC, XPSR is automatically safe for us inside the stack has been saved for us. So what do we need to do? We need to save the remaining registers manually. Okay, this has been saved automatically into the thread stack. Into the thread stack, uh, this one. Okay, so these have been saved automatically into the thread stack. Okay, so now uh, we need to manually save the remaining, we need to manually save the remaining registers. So what are the remaining registers? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. The remaining ones. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, which is what is happening here. You are actually saving four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven into the stack. So if you want to switch from one thread to the next thread, uh, you have to save the context of the current thread. So the current thread, uh, R0, R1, R2, R3, R12, uh, LRPC, XPSR have been automatically saved. So you need to manually save the remaining R4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, which is what is done here. Okay, after you save the remaining registers of the current thread, then you have to load. You have to load the registers of the next thread. So you load, you load R, R4, R5, R6, R7, R8, 9, 10, 11 of the next thread. Do you need to load? Do you need to load? Uh, do you need to load? Uh, do you need to load R0, 1, 2, 3, 12, this of the next thread? No need. Why? Because uh, when you return from the exception handler, uh, you will, you will uh, automatically unstack, right? So you will unstack, uh, you will, when you unstack, uh, because, because the thread 2, uh, the R0, 1, 2, 3, 12, LR, PC, XPSR is already inside here already. So when you unstack, uh, when you unstack, uh, you will unstack uh, those as well. They are already inside. Okay. So what you need to do manually is only uh, to save and load. R, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Why? Because these are not done automatically. Lah. Okay? The remaining ones, are uh, the stacking and unstacking uh, is done automatically for you. The remaining registers. Okay, so this one you have to do manually yourself. And because you have to manually do it yourself, you have to write this in assembly. Lah. So the pendable supervisor call handler uh, have no choice. It must be written in assembly. Right, so uh, for question three, uh, the real time systems, uh, real time systems, uh, right? You got four topics here. Now, the first topic, uh, RTS, uh, real time systems, uh, is uh, this topic here. Okay, so I'm sure that all of you, when you do your assignment two, you will have gone through this entire topic in detail, right? This Week seven notes uh, teach you how to write, uh, oh, sorry, this assignment one, uh, assignment one. 
when you're doing assignment one, you will have gone through these uh, notes in detail, right? Because this one teaches you how to write a program to respond to uh, uh, multiple inputs and outputs in real time. Okay, so you will use the super loop and then interrupts, right? So uh, you will have done this in assignment one already. So I'm sure you're very familiar with this. Okay, and then on week eight, on week eight, uh, what you learn uh, is uh, how to use the RTOS, specifically, uh, specifically uh, how to use the timer, timer, timer functions and thread functions. So this whole uh, week eight lecture notes uh, is actually uh, you're introduced to how to use the thread functions and how to use the virtual timer functions. Right, track functions and virtual timer functions. Because RTOS is actually just a library. You use the functions in the library to create threads and to use virtual timers. Right, then in the following week, oh, week nine, eh, you learn the RTOS uh, functions. Oh, you learn the RTOS functions oh, to control signals. To control signals. You learn the RTOS functions to control semaphores and a special case of binary semaphore we call it mutex and then you learn the uh, functions to control message queue and finally you learn the functions to control memory pool and mail queue okay so the rtos uh, is all about just knowing how to use these functions uh, where you see them in practice you in your section b labs 1 to 18 uh, you see all this being used, okay? So, uh, uh, this three, this one, you have, you 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 fully understand this if you did your assignment one nicely, okay? And this one, uh, if you have gone through the section B, lab one to eighteen, and you finish your assignment two, uh, I think you know how to use these functions already, okay? So the important part of real time systems question three uh, is all. Uh, uh, you need to know how the operating system works under the hood. How does it work? So how it works is uh, the basic function is context switching. And context switching uh, is done in assembly using the pen as we had learned. Okay. So uh, uh, please make sure that you, you understand uh, this example code, example 7. Uh, make sure you understand this example 7 in detail how context switching is performed in the pen sv handler okay and uh what is pen sv how do you do context switching and uh how you write the code for context switching in pen sv handler right? basically make sure you understand this example very very clearly right so uh if you have any questions uh, you can always uh, whatsapp or email me right okay let's continue uh. Let's continue. So we have uh, we have looked at the so coming back here uh, to the architecture. Just now we were talking about the architecture, the CPU. So the CPU is represented by the CPU registers, uh, and how you work with the CPU registers is you write your program in assembly. So when you write your program in assembly, uh, you are basically moving data around and doing operations on the data. So they are the instructions to do that, uh, okay? Now the next part of your processor architecture is the interrupt system. So the interrupt system, the interrupt system, uh, what you need to know is the interrupt mechanism. What happens uh, when the CPU detects an interrupt? So it's going to respond to the interrupt by stacking first, right? Doing automatic stacking, and then it's going to fetch the address of the interrupt service routine, we call it vector fetch. Fetch it from the vector table, the address of the interrupt service routine. Put that address into the program counter, and the next thing that happens is your processor will be executing the interrupt service routine already. Okay. So after it executes the interrupt service routine, right, uh, you will unstack. Right? You will unstack unstack and then resume back the interrupted program. So uh, I, I won't go through all these details. Uh, I'm just talking about the general concept. Uh, okay. 
So this is the interrupt system. And then after the interrupt system, uh, you learn about the memory system. So the memory system, uh, uh, the, the concept, uh, the concept would be, the important concept would be, right? memory uh, consists of ARM Cortex M processors. Uh, the memory is standardized and divided into these six regions. The first region is to store code, right? The second part here is to store data. This is where all your microcontroller peripherals are mapped to. Microcontroller peripherals are they are all placed here. They will be addressed here. This is external RAM. If internal RAM is not enough, this is external peripherals. If you if the microcontroller supports connecting uh, to external peripherals like uh, LCD, okay. So if your microcontroller uh, uh, supports connection to LCD, uh, so there are some special pins that can connect to the LCD. Uh, then uh, you can access the LCD memory through uh, these addresses here. Not this will be microcontroller specific, uh, right? The external peripherals that are supported uh, will be microcontroller specific. And lastly, uh, the upper part here, this is the system region. This is where you store all your the system region, uh, the system system region uh, is where you store all the registers to control the processor peripherals and debug peripherals. Okay, so this in shaded, uh, these are the peripherals to control your debug system, but it's not controlled by you, uh, it's controlled by the debugger, the debug host. Right, so this is the Registers are uh, to control the processor operation. We call this the CPU peripherals. Okay, their control registers are all located here. So this is the system region, right? And the system that by default, uh, the system region is the only region that requires privilege. So everything else uh, doesn't require privilege one. Only the system region uh, requires privilege access. Because the system region contain all the important system registers, man. Okay, so if you want uh, anywhere here, uh, you want privilege, uh, you can program it using the MPU, right? If you want anywhere here uh, uh, to have privilege, uh, you can use the MPU to program it, uh, but that's up to you. Uh. Okay, so this is the memory system. This is the uh, memory system. Okay, so the now the most important part of the processor architecture uh, is actually uh, the, the interrupt system. Okay, It's actually the interrupt system. In fact, uh, uh, microcontrollers, uh, microcontrollers for that matter, uh, the most important part of the microcontroller uh, is the interrupt, the capabilities of the interrupt system. Because without interrupts, uh, microcontrollers are useless. Right? You have to keep running you know, forever. You keep checking something to happen. Uh, you will burn your battery very fast. You run out of power. So the, the main reason why your battery powered systems, uh, they are so power efficient is because they always go to sleep. They only wake up when you press a button, when you do something, then they'll wake up and respond to your actions. Uh. So if you don't do some stuff, uh, after some time, uh, it will go back to sleep again. And the most important enabling system for this uh, is the interrupt system. So make sure that uh, you really understand uh, how the interrupt system works in practice. Uh. So uh, for example, uh, you can refer to, in practice, uh, you can refer to your lab manual, uh, lab four, the cystic interrupt, and lab five, working with multiple interrupts. So just refer to your, refer to your uh, lab four and lab five, okay? Interrupt system. So uh, for question one, uh, the processor architecture, uh, uh, the processor assembly language interrupts and memory, uh, the most important part would be the interrupt system. Okay? And the interrupt system uh, is not enough if you only know the theory. You need to know how it works in practice as well. So make sure that you really go through lab four and five and you really understand how the interrupt system works especially when you have multiple interrupts, different priorities. So you will have interrupt nesting, interrupt preemption. Higher priority interrupt will preempt lower priority interrupt. 
you will have interrupt nesting. Then you will have uh, your multiple levels of stacking. So you can observe uh, all these things uh, happening uh, just by looking at these two labs. Right? It pulls together everything that you learn here. And you look at these two labs. Okay? So for the processor architecture, uh, make sure that you really understand how the interrupt system works by going through these two labs. Right? Uh, for the question on software development, uh, make sure you know how to write libraries. Okay, we, when you develop software, we are most of the time uh, we are developing libraries. Okay, so make sure you really understand uh, how to create a library, a .c and a .h file, a library. Okay, a library or uh, this library is some call it an application programming interface, some call it a peripheral access layer, some call it a hardware abstraction layer. Okay, basically, uh, it contains pointers and structures, right? which allow you to access peripheral registers. Uh, normally, the file will be provided, for example, the lpc 17 xxh but you must know how to write your own header file. You must know how to write code uh, using pointers and structures to access peripheral registers. So an example is you can refer to uh, tutorial 2, you can refer to tutorial 2, question 5. Okay, on how this is done. And in fact, the entire week two lecture notes uh, talk about this. Your entire week two uh, lecture notes, right, talk about this, how you uh, access peripheral registers. Okay, because if you cannot access peripheral registers, uh, you cannot use the mail controller. So, okay, that is for question two. Okay, now question three, we talk about real-time systems. Uh. Real-time systems are uh, the most important part of an operating system is contact switching mechanism. And the contact switching mechanism is carried out in the NSV handler. So make sure that you, you understand, uh, make sure that you understand, uh, make sure that you understand how the PANSV works, the concept of the context switching. This is the context of context switching. Make sure you understand. Uh, the context, the, the concept, concept of context switching, right? How it works. And then uh, this is all theory concept. So the actual implementation example uh, is here. This is the actual uh, coding for context switching done in the PANSV handler. So you make sure that you, you know how this works and you can write this PANSV handler. Okay. So that is uh, part three. All right. So. Let me go on to the question four now. Question four is on uh, system design. So this uh, system design uh, is an uh, open-ended question. It's an open-ended question, right? Uh, you design something, okay? So I so can show you is uh, how to prepare for a system design. Just make sure that you did your assignment one and assignment two, two properly. Because uh, if you did your assignment one and your assignment two properly, you, you really coded yourself, you did everything properly, you will have all the necessary knowledge to answer this question, right? It will be very straightforward to you if you have done this. Okay? I, I think that that's all I want to say about this system design question uh, because it's an open-ended question. Okay? It's a design question. You'll be given something to design. And what you have this, what you have learned uh, from doing assignment one and assignment two uh, will allow you to very easily answer this. Not very easily, uh, It will allow you to answer this question. Uh, of course, some thinking is required. Okay, all right. So I have gone through all the important parts of uh, this subject already. I've covered all the important parts, and I've uh, given you some guidelines uh, on what to focus for the four questions now. Uh, do you have any questions? Do you have uh, any questions you want to ask? No question at all. Everyone is so quiet. 
Is everyone okay? Uh, is everyone okay? Uh, okay, let, let me let me take your attendance again first. Huh? Let me take your attendance again first. Uh, Chu Zhang Hing, are you here? Chu Zhang Hing? Chu Zhang Hing, are you here? Uh, Go Kian Sing? Go Kian Sing? Go Kian Sing? Ku Bun Piong? Okay, thank you. Lim Chun Wei? Lim Chun Wei? Lim Chun Wei, Long Yao Ting. Oh, I think I saw Long Yao Ting. Yes. Okay. Uh, Wong Chong Yi, Wong Chong Yi. Uh, let me just check here. Next one is Chun Wei Gen Sing Zhang Heng. Okay, uh, do you have any questions you want to ask? Any questions? Uh, so, uh, your exam is roughly two weeks from now, two weeks plus minus from now. Okay, so uh, I hope you are already somewhere through your revision already. Okay, um, if you have any questions, uh, you can just WhatsApp or email me. Uh, and for this week, right, our Wednesday class uh, uh, will be consultation session. So there will be no class on Wednesday. Okay, so uh, your Wednesday 2 to 3 p.m. Tomorrow 2 to 3 p.m. we will have no class. So I will be there for consultation. Right? I will be there for consultation. And also lab practical uh, later in the afternoon 2 to 4 o'clock. And Friday 4 to 6, I will also be in the Google Meet for consultation okay so we have no labs uh, this is our last class for this semester right thank you everyone for uh, staying staying until now so uh, this is our last class and uh, the wednesday 2 to 3 p.m lecture and your labs uh, later afternoon 2 to 4 and friday 4 to 6 will be consultation sessions so you can log into google meet and uh, we can discuss if you have any questions right so okay uh, if you have no questions for now, then we will stop here for today. Uh, oh, this is our last class. Huh? And uh, I will see you on the 7th of, uh, I will see you on the 7th of October. 7th of October for our uh, uh, final online assessment. Okay, so make sure you you prepare some blank or full scap K4 size papers with you. Huh? Right, and log in at eight forty-five uh, a.m. Huh? So this would be uh, eight forty-five a.m. Let me just add this here. Uh, Fifteen minutes, so eight forty-five a.m. Right, uh, okay, la. so um, uh, it's, it's very quiet. So uh, we will stop here for today and thank you everyone. I will see you during the final online assessment on 7th of October, okay?